I'm Selena Wang. This is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all of our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, the roadblocks are piling up as Tesla CEO Elon Musk tries to take the company private. We discuss who's on board and if government officials could stop in to stop the deal. Plus, what's the status of Cisco's transition to a more software and subscription-based model? We'll hear more from CEO Chuck Robbins. And highlights from the Bloomberg Player Summit. How does one of the most high profile in the NBA balance his game on the court while tech investing on the side? We'll sit down with Andre Iguodala of the Golden State Warriors. But first to our top story, Elon Musk is facing some roadblocks to take Tesla private. The company has received a subpoena from the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission indicating the regulatory scrutiny of his statements and tweets have reached a more serious stage. Meanwhile, Musk may be looking to Saudi Arabia's private wealth fund to secure the capital it needs, but it could give the fund leverage to exert significant influence. We discussed with Bloomberg's Detroit Bureau Chief David Welch and Bloomberg Businessweek's Max Chafkin. The issue is that with the Trump administration, where it's not totally clear how CFIUS, which is the government body that, that regulates this sort of thing, uh, foreign investments in, in U.S. companies, would would treat something like this. Um, uh, earlier this year, uh, the, the Trump administration basically stopped the Broadcom Qualcomm uh, deal on national security grounds. The idea being that if Qualcomm were taken over, it would somehow hurt the U.S. Uh, uh, you know, in, hurt our interest. And you could imagine a similar argument being made with electric vehicles and a especially batteries, because Tesla obviously, uh, you know, has a big chunk of the total electric vehicle production, at least definitely in the U.S., and plans to have a huge amount of battery production. So you can imagine that 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 being an issue, and it's just going to be one of many headaches that uh, Tesla and Elon Musk will have to deal with over the coming uh, weeks, months, maybe even years. Uh, meantime, this, this report on the SEC sending a subpoena. David, walk us through the continued hurdles that remain to getting a deal done. Yeah, so Elon has uh, a lot of things he has to get done here. First of all, this issue with the SEC seems to just be getting worse. And if they, if this does mean that they're opening an official investigation, as Max was saying, you have CFIUS, now you've got this. It will take a long time to wind through all of this unless the SEC quickly concludes that he didn't do anything wrong. There are some shareholder lawsuits out there. Uh, he, he was sued when they did the Solar City deal, that is when Tesla acquired Solar City in 2016. That didn't hold things up then, but this is now related to whether or not he had funding lined up and whether or not he manipulated the stock. So these lawsuits are sort of running in parallel with what the SEC is doing. Again, more hurdles for him that could take time. And then look, he's got to get a number of shareholders, in his own words, about two-thirds of them, to agree to exchange their public shares for a private holding, something less liquid and something that is controlled by a man who obviously doesn't like scrutiny and may not be as, well, certainly won't be as transparent once this company is private. So he's got to do that just to get to the point where he can convince the Saudis or others to buy out those who don't want to go along with him. A lot of steps here that are both market-oriented and legal that he's got to get done just to, just to get to the point where he can really push the deal ahead. Meantime, Max, the board is under even more scrutiny and, and looking at some of the board dynamics, Musk has said um, he will you know, abstain from these discussions, as will his brother, who's also on the Tesla board. You've also got some Tesla board members who are also on the board of SpaceX. There are reports that the Tesla board is lawyering, lawyering up talk to us about the very complicated board dynamics here. Yeah, so I mean, even in a normal uh, buyout situation, this would be sort of rough, right? Because the CEO has kind of a, a, a huge amount of control and influence over the company, um, and it's, it's hard to have a, an arm's length transaction. This situation is worse for two reasons. First, because Elon Musk is so central to Tesla's valuation. If he were to resign or be pushed out, you'd imagine that the stock price would probably fall because a lot of people believe that he's crucial to this company's future. The second problem is this board makeup, as you were saying, where, where a, a majority of the board members have you know, very close connections to Elon Musk. So, so it's hard to, to imagine how they're going to evaluate this transaction objectively, and you could you 
you could imagine, you know, further lawsuits from disgruntled shareholders who maybe say that that this is, you know, they're not getting the best deal possible. On the other hand, like we're not seeing any deals right now. It's not clear that there, you know, that there's enough funding to make this original deal possible. So this we may be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Meantime, David, you have a new story out about the leverage that the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund now has as a result of Musk revealing that they would be such a big part of this at the same time that we're in the middle of an administration that is working to limit the investment of uh, foreign stakeholders in U.S. technology. You know, how does this um, add an additional really big wrinkle? So, yeah, this gets very interesting. So the Saudis already, according to Elon, have close to 5% in Tesla. And the, uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund would, according to Elon, I strongly hinted in his letter, they would take on a bigger stake to help them take the company private. And he's been talking to them since 2017 about doing that. One analyst estimates that they could end up with a stake as large as Elon's, around 20%. If that happens, sure, he's out of the public markets. He doesn't have uh, social, he doesn't have a bunch of short sellers sniping out of much uh, social media and analysts asking questions uh, on earnings calls. But what he does have are some, is now a new shareholder sitting on his shoulder that's got a stake as large, potentially as large as his. No, the Saudis aren't like Bill Ackman, they aren't like Carl Icahn in the sense that they're going to tell him how to run the company. But you look at some of the investments they've made, they do often like those companies to make investments or uh, hire people in Saudi Arabia. That's part of what they do is bring technology, bring knowledge, bring jobs into the kingdom. You could see maybe pressure on Elon to build a gigafactory in Saudi Arabia. That's one thing that an analyst speculated about. But they're going to want something in exchange for helping him with this big project. That was Bloomberg's David Welch and Max Chafkin. Coming up, Turkey's president calls for a boycott on American-made electronics in response to U.S. sanctions. What a prolonged crisis in Turkey could mean for the iPhone and more. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. President Erdogan remained defiant in response to U.S. sanctions in Turkey, vowing to boycott American electronics like the iPhone and stand firm in the face of what he calls a, quote, explicit economic attack. Here's what he had to say at a speech in Ankara this week. Every single product we buy from abroad should be produced by ourselves and we sell them to others instead of buying them from others. Electronic products of USA, we will boycott them. The U.S. has shown no signs of relenting, warning there will be no negotiations about sanctions until a detained American pastor is released. Bloomberg Markets editor Romaine Bostic and Bloomberg Technology Mark German joined us to discuss the boycott. Their market share in terms of smartphone OS usage, iOS, is very small. It's sub 20 percent, so it's not very significant. But this news is very significant optically. Now people are saying, hmm, why is the iPhone banned in Turkey all of a sudden? People who don't understand the trade situation, right? But what if this is also the start of a new thing where different countries are asking Apple to build iPhones locally or they're going to start making it more difficult for them to sell? We've seen this in India already. Now we have the China and U.S. trade war, and now we have Turkey. So is this going to continue to be uh, a dominant? effect and we'll see more of this in the future that's the problem tim cook uh, apple ceo did meet with president trump over the weekend here's a clue on what might have been discussed uh, tim cook did address uh, the trade dispute on the earnings call a couple of weeks ago take a listen to what he had to say our view on tariffs is that uh, they uh, show up as, as a uh, tax on the consumer and uh, wind up resulting in lower economic growth and and sometimes can bring about significant uh, risk of unintended consequences. 
Uh, that said, the, the trade relationships and agreements that the U.S. has between uh, with, between the U.S. and other major economies are very complex, and it's clear that several are are in need of modernizing. In need of modernizing. So, Romaine, Tim Cook sort of hedging a little bit there. What do you imagine uh, transpired in this conversation with the president, and how much sway does a company like Apple have as the most valuable company in the world? Well, it's the most valuable company in the world. It's also a major employer, and it has a major economic impact, not just on California, but on a lot of other states as well. And I think Tim Cook knows that. Also, I should point out, too, that this isn't unusual. Anytime you have a CEO of one of the largest companies, Companies in the world. Uh, you think back in the past, whether it was names like General Electric or Boeing, other companies that were sort of at the top, they all had to have good relationships with the administration that was in power at the time uh, in the interest of sort of furthering their business and really just making sure that the economic environment was stable enough to sort of facilitate whatever it was they were trying to sell. So uh, the president of Turkey ha has called for Turkish citizens to buy Venus smartphones, which are made by Vestal Electronics, they're pretty excited. How do their products compare to the iPhone? Oh, I mean, it's totally two different worlds, right? The iPhone is this premium product, while these Venus smartphones are a bit lower end, more mass consumer. And if you think about the iPhone market in Turkey, I saw a stat today on Bloomberg indicating that an iPhone 10, obviously a thousand in the U.S., significantly more in Turkey, it's about 5x uh, the cost of the average income on a, a monthly basis for some people uh, in Turkey or people on minimum wage income in Turkey. So the, the iPhone 10 is not an affordable phone per se. Certainly not affordable in the U.S., but definitely not affordable to many uh, in Turkey. Apple doesn't have as much distribution as they do in other places, only two Apple stores across Turkey. So in the long, in the scheme of things right now, not in the long term, in the short term, it's not a big deal. But I think the big problem long term is if other countries start, you know, tacking on to this and are asking Apple to build things locally. So, Romaine, you know, given the strength of the Turkish lira in general, what is the actual purchasing power of, you know, people living in the country to even buy American electronics in general? Yeah, well, it's not high. I mean, keep in mind, I mean, Mark just talked about the, the five times, uh, uh, you know, the, what the income is there. I mean, keep in mind that right now an iPhone 10, the very the lowest model there uh, would be about 7,500 lira at today's exchange rate. That's somewhere around 12 or 1,300 U.S. dollars. So uh, pretty pricey, uh, particularly for an economy that just really isn't at the same level as the U.S. But keep in mind, even for other electronics, uh, this really isn't a big market for imported electronics. I mean, when you think about the amount of uh, products that Turkey imports from the U.S. Electronics is about a tenth of that, less than a tenth of that, really. And when you get into things like smartphones and other things, it's much less than that. So this isn't really an economy that was really in a position to afford a lot of these higher end models to begin with. And now with the depreciation of the currency, uh, it's looking less likely that they would be able to afford it, uh, given uh, all that's happened. So I think that uh, the uh, the message from Erdogan is sort of moot to a certain uh, extent, uh, at least until this economy gets back, back on track, most of its citizens probably aren't going to be able to afford these products. Same mark for broader American electronics outside of Apple? Right. The prices, because of the exchange rate with the Turkish lira, makes a lot of these high-end electronics simply unaffordable to many people in Turkey. And Apple's had their struggles in Turkey. This isn't the first time they had to deal with it. I'm really looking at this from the long term, the long game right now. How is this going to affect Apple in many other countries, ones that are more important to them than Turkey? So perhaps these threats more bark than bite. Um, I do want to stay on Apple for a moment, though. Hedge fund manager David Einhorn, Einhorn sold shares of Apple in the second quarter before it crossed that $1 trillion threshold. Einhorn, who runs Green Light Capital, trimmed his stake in Apple by 486,000 shares, reducing his position to about $26 million. That's according to regulatory filings. Now, Romain, we are expecting to see more of these 13F filings in the next few days. Do you think we'll see more of the same from other big tech hedge funds? Well, it'll be interesting. I did take a look uh, uh, earlier today. I mean, you did get a couple other hedge funds like Piedmont, which did have a significant reduction in their holdings. The green light one was a little interesting, especially considering Einhorn is considered a value investor. Uh, you know, it's not clear why he got out of this position, but he's really been on the wrong sides of a lot of trades this year, including on Tesla and on GM. But as we get more of these filings, I think you have to keep in mind that the shares did have a pretty good run 
prior to the end of the second quarter. So it wouldn't be uh, surprising to see uh, some hedge funds sort of, you know, cash in their chips. Uh, you know, you could have easily looked at this stock at the end of June and thought that was the top. There's really not much more higher this is going to get. Of course, they would have been proven wrong, but it's not like they lost money on this trade. Apple was a fantastic trade for the past couple of years, uh, which is the time frame that a lot of these funds were in it. That was Bloomberg's Romain Bostic and Mark Gurman. Coming up, Tencent has suffered its first profit drop in over a decade as the Chinese government cracks down on new game releases. Can the tech giant recover? And later, how an NBA champion wants to build a winning team for his tech investments. We hear from Golden State Warriors superstar Andre Iguodala. This is Bloomberg. Amazon has decided to aggressively broaden the programming on Twitch to take on its video rival YouTube in a bid to grab a larger slice of the online advertising pie. Amazon is pursuing exclusive live streaming deals with dozens of popular media companies and personalities. Twitch is offering minimum guarantees of as much as a few million dollars a year, as well as a share of future advertising sales and subscription revenue. It looks like Facebook has company when it comes to disappointing tech earnings. This time the results are out of China, where Tencent posted its first drop in at least a decade. Shares plunged in reaction to the news. The Chinese social media giant has now lost more than $160 billion in market value since January. And Chinese regulators forced Tencent to halt distribution of a popular video game and has frozen approvals of game licenses amid a government shakeup. But despite that, gaming and its popular WeChat app are still going strong. We spoke to Ben Harburg, managing partner of MSA Capital in Beijing. Listen, in the gaming space in China, we've seen substantial amounts of government involvement around regulation, consumer protection. It's obviously been a theme over the last few weeks when we've had faulty vaccines, uh, peer-to-peer lending issues. So, um, you know, we didn't, it's not too surprising to see them have struggles with some of the games coming out the gate. Um, and I think that in the long term, those can be corrected. Uh, for the sake of, t- of Tencent, though, I think some of their bigger issues lie with the losses that they've seen in total share of users time. So um, other competitors like Totiao cropping in, taking up to 10 percent of what used to be a market dominated by, by Tencent in that space. Totiao, which is sort of like China's version of, of YouTube, Selena. Um, mobile gaming revenue declined 19 percent. How much of this is the result of bigger issues at play, whether it's trade tensions or, you know, the Chinese government crackdown? The largest cause of this substantial drop is really domestic regulatory pro- processes and problems. So there is this bureaucratic shakeup happening in the government right now. And because of that, there's been sort of this power vacuum. And amid that, none of these bureaucrats want to stand out and accidentally make a change that could uh, severely hurt the government's broader censorship policy. And so because of that, these licenses have been halted for several months. For a long time, Tencent was seen as this unshakable social media giant. But what people forget is at its core, it's a gaming company and they make a very significant portion of their profits, of their revenue from gaming. And because of this, they can't cash out on some of their biggest blockbuster games like Fortnite. And the fact that one of their biggest blockbuster games was forced to be recalled shortly after it was announced shows that they are not immune to the issues of the Chinese government. And that's why we're seeing this reaction. And, you know, it's ironic given that the Chinese government and also has helped these Chinese tech giants flourish, you know, in part by blocking U.S. technology companies from operating in the country. Ben, you know, do you have any insight into why regulators are now cracking down on these games in particular and if there's any end in sight? You know, China's been suffering from an epidemic of gaming addiction. Uh, some estimates put it at 23, or 23 million uh, individuals in China suffering from addiction here. So uh, consumer protection has come to the forefront of the Chinese government's agenda. And I think that they're going to continue to look at different modes, uh, different platforms, Totiao uh, as well hit by this, that are uh, responsible for grabbing users, extreme amounts of users' time, and then also obviously sucking their bank accounts dry through in-game purchases. So. I think that this will continue to be a trend uh, for, for the foreseeable future, particularly in gaming. 
Selena, talk to us a little bit about the, the competition. You know, we mentioned Totiao. Where else are users spending their time? So in terms of the gaming landscape, they have a lot of competitors there, but this regulatory crackdown is affecting industry-wide. So we're going to see players like NetEase also be impacted by this. In terms of engagement, WeChat, uh, Tencent is facing some of the similar problems that Facebook is. It's becoming so large and dominant that they're starting to read saturation, so the growth rate is starting to slow. Totiao is this news aggregation app that Tencent certainly has their eyes on. They have very strong artificial intelligence that's able to draw in users and keep them into their ecosystems. There are also a slew of other video sharing apps that are also gaining a lot of traction in China. That being said, Tencent still is the dominant place where Chinese internet users spend their times. In addition to WeChat, they also have Alipay, their financial arm. Uh, they have this mini programs apps that's going to also be a way to draw in users. Users will be able to bypass actually the traditional app stores and just directly use services within WeChat. So they have a lot of things at work that are trying to keep people within their ecosystem. But that being said, they do have a lot of competitors. Ben, what's your short and long term outlook here? I think in the short term, they're going to struggle. I don't see any light at the immediate end of the tunnel for some of these games, particularly, um, you know, PUBG looks like it could get stuck in the regulatory approval process up until even next year. Um, and so I think that their, you know, their main revenue driver gaming is continue going to be hit. But in the long term, I do think there are plenty of potential for them to continue to expand what they do. They need to continue to squeeze the juice out of WeChat uh, through in improving their payment mechanisms, mini apps, mini games. Um, looking to add additional services as they have with uh, identification, uh, biometrics, things like that, uh, and then expanding as well along to, to new revenue streams. Obviously, we saw that um, things like uh, cloud computing and payments surge for them in this quarter, 81%. Um, their monthly active users on payments is 800 million. So, um, you know, they have an ingrained advantage over someone like Alipay because you're already in their app uh, buying things, socializing with your friends, and so it makes it quite easy to use things like payments, but they're going to have to expand those offerings and cope with some of the new regulations by the Chinese government that increase the uh, reserve rates that each, each company has to have in the central bank. Selena, meantime, Tencent has invested $93 billion in hundreds of other companies, including Snap and Tesla. Are there any upsides from, from some of these investments that Tencent will be benefiting from? They actually blame some of their profit declines on a fewer investment games. They actually cashed out of startups like LMA and Mobike in order to bankroll some of their other investments and other services. Uh, their Snapchat investment, we still have yet to see, but so far they haven't done so well this year. Tesla, there's a lot of questions about where that Lots stock going is on. going to go. <laughs> uh, people also forget that Tencent has a U.S. investments arm that's very strategic. They have uh, here in the Bay Area and they look at a lot of very early stage startups. And when I've been looking at the data, they've still been relatively active. They haven't come into any CFIUS issues in terms of those areas. And those are really focused on very early stage uh, frontier tech investments. And we have yet to see how those will play out. That was Ben Harburg of MSA Capital. Coming up, their friends on the basketball court, but their rival investors off of it. We hear from Golden State Warriors star Andre Iguodala on his tech investing rivalry with his teammates. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. In San Francisco, a lot of tech action today. Our top stories this morning in D.C. and the Dow and the S&P. Shall we? So the euro on a seven-day winning streak. The currency stock average is down half. We begin in the oil patch. Saudi Arabia. Brent crude, pretty much unchanged. Welcome to Bloomberg, the first word Asia. We the U.S. and Japan duke it out over exchange. China rate. slumping on short bond market. Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Selena Wang. Andre Iguodala may have three NBA titles to his name, but he's also got a host of hot tech investments, including Linebike and footwear company Allbirds. 
The Golden State Warrior star is one of the growing number of sports stars making a name in the world of venture capital. And he says it's actually a lot like building a championship basketball team. Emily Chang spoke exclusively with Iguodala on the sidelines of the Bloomberg Players Technology Summit here in San Francisco. To invest in people, to invest in an entrepreneur, um, Jeff Jordan, uh, Andrew Horowitz, uh, he's taking me under his wing, taking my team under his wing. He's helped us tremendously and he always says invest in the entrepreneur. Uh, it's not always a company and I've been on both sides of that and investing in the entrepreneur is definitely the way to go. People that are genuine, people that have a passion, uh, you know, people that, you know, well, really want to work hard and they have the credentials and, uh, you know, those are the ones that most likely will, uh, you know, help you see through your investment. What are some parallels you found on the court and investing off the court? Well, it's similar to being a general manager, actually, and I have a really good relationship with our GM, Bob Myers. So, uh, we have a really good relationship and we speak a lot about, you know, putting the right personalities together, uh, putting the right coach in place. Uh, it's basically you putting the team together to win a championship. And, and it's similar when investing um, you, you, and being a VC. You know, you, you got the right entrepreneur, you're putting the right CMO behind them, you're putting the right CFO there, uh, you're getting the right marketing team in place, you're, you're making uh, the right hires, um, you're going out and, and you're seeking the, the best recruits to come in and, and help your business grow uh, as best possible. So talk to us a little bit about what your portfolio Portfolio looks like and where you've had success. So I've been investing in a lot of different companies, uh, whether it be consumer products or uh, such as Harper Wild or Madison Reed. Uh, but at the same time, um, sports-related uh, esports, uh, TSM uh, was my last uh, investment. Um, Lime Scooters, another product uh, has made a lot of headlines recently and some things that uh, are close to me, uh, Thrive Global with Ariana Huffington and uh, that's a wellness space and a wellness platform and um, I've dealt with uh, sleep deprivation and you know, doing yoga, meditating, changed my entire diet. So that's something that's close to home that um, I can preach about you know, all day to you know, not just those in the sports world but you know, normal walks of life. Have you had any exit so far? Have you made any money? I actually haven't had any exits, but I've had um, some companies who uh, who are killing it. Um, I had some companies who I passed on, and I regretted it, and I just got in the, uh, the last round, and uh, that's GOAT, uh, the shoe marketplace. It's the largest shoe marketplace uh, platform, and uh, I actually passed on it because I was like just my introductory meeting, and that was like the first meeting I took, and I kind of didn't quite know what to do with it, but it was a great learning experience and uh, luckily uh, I was able to again get in on my uh, on the last round. And off the court, teammates Kevin Durant and Steph Curry are also in the VC game and that can mean some healthy competition. Iguodala discussed his rivalries, relationships and investment strategy. We share information. Uh, there's some deals that um, I passed on that Steph got in um, and then I'm seeing KD do some great things in the deals he's in. Uh, they've been in a few of the big funds and you know I look at it as you know African American men getting into a space that we've really haven't had much to, to do with or we haven't had much access to so I looked at it as a, all of those as positives you know uh, you know the, the players Tech Summit, Technology Summit is uh, going on right now and when you look in that room you see a lot of diversity, you see a lot of African American men and, and it's, that's something that you look back on whether you make uh, you know a thousand X or you lose your, your investments, that's something that you look at as, as a positive and, and that's the legacy you want to leave behind. Andreessen Horowitz just launched a new fund called the Culture Fund, $15 million to back black celebrities, black athletes and all of the proceeds that they get, the goal is to, is to make money but the proceeds will go to um, boosting uh, black nonprofits. Um, what's your take on this fund? Are you part of it? I, I am not a part of it, but uh, I have great relationships with uh, a lot of those guys. Uh, Chris Lyons uh, is probably, you wouldn't expect me to say his name, but that's a close friend of mine, and uh, he's working hard with that. Um, obviously, uh, Mark and Ben mm -hmm. uh, close with it. Um, but for me, uh, I know a lot of those people that are, are within that fund, and it's a great thing. And, you know, uh, the Hidden Genius Project is an Oakland-based uh, project where they 
teach uh, African American uh, men, young men, uh, how to code and, you know, follow them throughout the rest of their uh, lives with their coding. Uh, we have Black Girls Code, a part of the Players Technology Summit last year, and then we have All Star Code, which is an East Coast based group in this year, and they're looking to spread and collaborate with uh, the Hidden Genius Project. So um, whenever you see um, the, the, our community uh, being embraced and then we take that and we give it back to our kids, so that's when you start to see change and, and that's when you start to see um, you know, our, our culture b being able to be equal and that's equality is given access and, and having opportunities that uh, we didn't have previously. That said, $15 million for a company that has a 1.5 billion under management doesn't seem like that much. There's been chatter that right. it's, it's not that big of a right. fund. It could be so much bigger. Right. And, but it, it's awareness as well, because it could be bigger. But the awareness is, you know, that conversation is actually good. You know, it's not enough. So what are we going to do to make it bigger? Or, or do, we do, do we do it on our own? It's, it's, it comes a point in time where it's up to us to uh, do it on our own. And you see that with uh, LeBron James and the amazing thing he did with uh, the I Promise School and um, how that's caused a lot of chatter. Um, Kevin Durant's doing some amazing things um, well, with, with Conway, uh, Ron Conway and Topher Conway with uh, building some track and field facilities for colleges and schools. And uh, Michael Jordan uh, supposedly didn't give enough of a backing of LeBron, but he his Jordan brand gives out scholarships to kids every single year. So um, just starting a conversation or providing um, just starts it and, and hopefully we'll continue to grow it every year. That was our exclusive interview with Golden State Warriors player Andre Iguodala speaking at the Bloomberg Players Technology Summit. A group of Tinder founders, executives and early employees have sued IAC and Match Group claiming the owners of the dating app are trying to cheat them out of billions of dollars in options. The group, which includes former CEO Sean Rad, claim IAC and Match created an artificially low valuation of Twitter Tinder to avoid paying the group money they're due under options agreements. Coming up, Dropbox CEO Drew Houston on running a public company and the recent departure of COO Dennis Woodside. And later, Cisco gives a bullish forecast for the current quarter, signaling confidence that an overhaul of its computer networking products is working. We'll hear from CEO Chuck Robbins. This is Bloomberg. Since going public in March, Dropbox has had some ups and downs. The stock price spiked on its IPO and again after its first earnings report earlier this summer, only to dramatically fall after a surprise departure of COO Dennis Woodside, despite another quarter of strong earnings. We caught up with Dropbox CEO Drew Houston and talked about what's changed for him since going public. In some ways, it's kind of back to work or back to business as usual. Uh, and part of our path to being public, we have been running the company like a public company for the past couple of years. Um, so if anything, it's been back to recruiting and building. So you just reported strong earnings. You also announced your COO, mm -hmm. Dennis Woodside, who was there for four years, is leaving. And investors seem spooked by that. Should they be concerned? I don't think they should be concerned. I mean, Dennis has been amazing. Like, he's been an incredible partner to me. And uh, when I think about, think back to where we were when he joined the company, we were a fraction of the size, like a few hundred million in revenue, and now we're a global company with 2,000 people, offices around the world. Um, and uh, and it's actually because the business is in such great shape that he can pass a torch. And so importantly, he has built an awesome team and, uh, and we'll miss Dennis. And I'm sure he'll continue to go on and do amazing things, but I'm also sure that the team we have and that, that he has built and led will as well. So what is your plan to get more individuals and more corporations paying for these higher priced subscription plans? Well, we've been making a lot of progress. And, and to me, it starts with building a great product. And so over the last quarter, we have we announced a bunch of improvements to the core Dropbox experience and, and, and to Dropbox papers, things like paper templates, um, and a number of improvements to the admin experience for, for, uh, for IT admins. So we start there. And then when we think about driving adoption of the higher tier plans, uh, some of the newer features like SmartSync, um, 
are only available in the highest tier of uh, or highest tier individual um, subscription or in the business version of Dropbox. So we, we focus first on engagement, and driving improved, or making the product as good as possible, and then we do a lot on the back end to drive conversion and build into the product uh, ways to match people with either the the paid plan that makes the most sense for them or functionality that they haven't been using yet. So if you're running out of space on your computer, then we can show you SmartSync and uh, that's driven a lot of the ARPU expansion or a lot of the growth in uh, revenue per subscriber over the last couple of years. At the same time, you have these cloud giants like Amazon and Google and Microsoft wanting a bigger and bigger piece of the pie. What is Dropbox going to continue to do to differentiate itself? Well, for us, competition isn't zero sum. And so we've existed alongside uh, the office suites and, and companies like Microsoft and Google pretty much since the beginning. And so what our customers turn to us to do is tie it all together. Because with office suites, tend to they keep you within their apps. But when we look at our customers and we look at their phones, they got everything, mm -hmm. right? They've got all the Microsoft apps. They've got Dropbox. They've got Google. And no one is helping them pull all that together. And so the fact that we partner with everyone and that we help organize all of your content across a different ecosystem is place to our strengths. That said, I mean, the cloud landscape is changing dramatically. And, you know, I feel like, you know, you and I have been talking over the last, what, eight years or so, and um, it's always been about the competition. Mm -hmm. What keeps you up at night, given how fast the landscape is changing? You know, what do you worry about? Well, so I mean, it's a, there's a war for talent out there, and that continues. And so making sure that we have the best people, and also just making sure we're placing the right portfolio of bets. And so we, we all, it's, it's striking the balance between continuing to improve our core product, um, then also developing new products like paper, and then planting seeds for future products that will be part of the core business. What about acquisitions? Do you plan to do any uh, we will in this continue. environment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, build, buying companies has been a great um, way for us to, to build our company. So um, whether that's bringing great talent into the company, we've done a couple dozen talent acquisitions. Uh, even new products like Dropbox Paper were seeded by a acquisition, uh, an acquisition called Hackpad. Um, and so being a public company uh, make, uh, makes it easier to do larger acquisitions. And so that's something that will certainly continue to look at. Any areas in particular that you're interested in? Um, well, so I mean, we continue, any, anything that helps people work better together. Um, and so we take a pretty wide view of that. Um, and, and when we, we look at acquisitions in terms of how do we bring great talent to the company, or how do we accelerate our product roadmap, or how do we accelerate our business. So when you look at where the growth is going to come from, is it going to come from adding new customers, or is it going to come from somewhere else? Well, it's really both. So we're focused on driving subscriber growth and then driving revenue per subscriber. And so on the former, we look at our business. We've got hundreds of millions of people who are monetizing users who have who are registered for Dropbox and at 11 well 11.9 million subs uh, we still have a lot of headroom among the people who who, who use Dropbox and to grow um, so we're, we continue to be focused on driving subscriber growth and we've improved that a lot over the last or we've, th those numbers have gone way up over the last couple of years that was Dropbox CEO Drew Houston time for the latest installment of our next job series where we look at the careers of the future. Tech giants like Amazon and Alphabet are causing a buzz with their trials for drone deliveries and the race to get operating commercially. But in Rwanda and East Africa, one company is already up and away. Zipline has been part of a remarkable network delivering blood to remote Rwandan hospitals by drone since 2016. Bloomberg Technologies digital editor Aki Ito tells a remarkable story. This is Rwanda. Nestled between these plantations, village homes, and meandering mountain roads is a patch of land no bigger than a football field. From here, this guy launches drones that carry blood to doctors racing to save their patients' lives. My name is Nizeman Abdul Salam, and uh, I'm a drone operator. Abdul works for a startup called Zipline. This is where uh, you catch the drones, like that, that's the recovery system. Uh -huh. And uh, in front of you, this is where we launch the drones. Zipline is headquartered in California, but it's all the way here 
west of Rwanda's capital, Kigali, that the companies launched one of the world's first drone delivery services. So beautiful. <laughs> Does it ever get old? No. Yeah. Abdul and his co-workers are tackling a deadly problem here. Rwanda is among the poorest countries in the world, and much of it is connected by winding, bumpy dirt roads in the mountains that get washed out in the rainy seasons. That's made it incredibly difficult for regional hospitals to procure blood in an emergency, leaving doctors unable to perform many life-saving operations. The hospital have to procure the car, they have to drive, I don't know, for three or four hours to Kigali, get the blood and then come back, so that's complicated. The idea is to give access to those uh, people who live in the more areas to the healthcare system. When a hospital asks for blood, the zipline team gets moving. If it's a typical day, you grab a package, you load it in the, in the plane, you launch it, and then you wait for the next order. Guided by GPS and other sensors, the drone flies itself to one of the hospitals it serves. Then, it reaches its destination and drops off its payload. Hospital staff retrieve the supplies, and the drone heads back to base. Abdul is doing pretty well for himself these days. He's got a job he loves, and he's studying for grad school. But all that success today is built from unimaginable tragedy. When he was three, the Rwandan government stepped up its decades-long assault on the Tutsi minority, ordering everyone in the Hutu majority to kill all Tutsis. In just 100 days, 800,000 people were slaughtered by their neighbors and their friends. When uh, the people who were doing the genocide showed up, my father was the first to step out. We could like, hear the voice uh, kind of in the corridor, people talking, <clears throat> asking like, where, where, is the rest of, of, where is the rest of the family? And then they basically hid anyone, like everyone with a machete. Abdul survived. His two siblings and his parents didn't. His grandma found him and took him in. The first uh, couple of years of school was uh, really, really hard. Yeah, you um, were dealing with the trauma. Yeah, and then uh, after that I found, I found my life again. I was like, okay, if I get my education right and uh, I use the knowledge I have, then I'm, I'm happy with my life. I think like I got another chance to live. And I think using it for serving the community and uh, making an impact on other people's life was what makes sense for me. That was Bloomberg's Aki Ito. Coming up, Cisco reports higher revenue from all regions in all of its major product areas in the latest quarter. We hear from CEO Chuck Robbins about the company's transformation. This is Bloomberg. In its latest earnings results, Cisco took a bit of a victory lap, saying its strategy and product overhaul is clearly working. CEO Chuck Robbins discussed the results and changing customer needs with Bloomberg's John Farrow. You know, we had a uh, good quarter. I think the strategy is clearly working. Our product and the, the innovation we're bringing to our customers as they navigate this multi-cloud world is actually they're being well received. We saw growth across uh, you know, very balanced across all of our technology areas. And uh, this transition that we talked about, the business model work that we've been doing is uh, continues to take hold with our software and subscription business continuing to grow. Uh, to your question relative to what's going on, th that we, we're, we have a lot of things happening around us right now for sure. So if you look at our performance, I think it's 
We have clearly driven a significant amount of innovation in our portfolio. Our teams have done an amazing job. And at the same time, we've had a very strong, you know, global macroeconomic environment to operate in. And uh, right now, we obviously have some dynamics with the rising dollar. We have you know, some uncertainty in some of the emerging countries. We've got the trade dynamics. So those are things that we don't necessarily control. So we will have to deal with those as they evolve. But uh, right now, things uh, feel pretty good. Chuck, we're going to talk about the transition in a little bit more detail in a moment because it, clearly it's very successful. The stock's doing well in the pre-market. You bring up the U.S. dollar, and it's something that always interests me. How do you handle that in the C-suite? Is it something you've hedged, or do you just sort of let it rip and it balances out over time? Well, we've, we've gone through this, you know, at various times over the years, so our teams know how to manage it. Uh, we actually uh, have a set of processes that uh, our teams deploy when this begins to occur. Uh, and then, we, you know, we typically come out the other side, but uh, it's something that we've dealt with over time and we'll deal with it again. It's the reality of running a, a big multinational global business, and so uh, our teams know how to handle it. So, more broadly speaking, I want to understand the pickup that we're seeing in the business. Do you see it related to the strength of balance sheets in general, just rising business confidence, or is something else happening? Are we seeing the spending driven by, say, the modernization of legacy IT systems? Which one is it, Chuck? John, I think it's both, and, and I talked about this on our call yesterday. There is clearly uh, a lot of business confidence. There's a lot of economic tailwinds right now, but at the same time, I think the the launch that we did last year uh, in our intent-based networking portfolio, the work our teams have done in our collaboration portfolio, the security portfolio, are, those things are really resonating with our customers. When you look at a Catalyst 9000 that we launched that has a software subscription on top of it, and the fact that it's the fastest ramping product in the history of the company, that says that there's some deep innovation there that's obviously being you know, bolstered by great economic conditions. So uh, it's a little bit of both, but uh, we'll, we'll take both when we get them. Lift the lid on the conversations you're having with the clients at the moment, Chuck. Give me some insight on what your customers are investing into more generally and more specifically. What are the areas of lower priority for them at the moment? Well, if you look at what's happening with our customers, they're, go they're undergoing a fundamental shift in that historically they've run their applications in their private data centers. And now they have applications running in their private data centers, but they also have, they're consuming SaaS applications, they're consuming services from public cloud providers, and so their, their networks and how their traffic is flowing is just fundamentally change, and how they need to deploy security is fundamentally changing. So they're having to rethink their entire IT infrastructure, the architecture, the security, and we're at the heart of how they think about that. So that's, that's a big thing that they're all focused on. That was Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins speaking to Bloomberg's John Farrow. That does it for this edition of Best of Bloomberg Technology. We'll bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. Tune in each day at 5 p.m. New York and 2 p.m. San Francisco. And Bloomberg Technology is also live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.